being the fragrance of life. And it's based on uh, Second Corinthians in chapter 2, uh, verses 14, 15, 16, we read. The Apostle Paul writes, And thanks be to God, who always leads us in a triumphal position, position in Jesus Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of knowledge of Him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ, among those who are saved, among those who are perishing, to the one with the smell of death, another the fragrance of life. To those who are perishing, we are the smell of death. Those who are saved, we are the fragrance of life. And the Bible very clearly says in this passage that wherever we go, God leads us in a triumphal presence of Jesus Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. So in us is the Lord Jesus Christ living in us. And sometimes we forget it. We tend to forget that the Lord lives inside us. The body of the temples of the Holy Spirit. So wherever we go, He goes. There's no such place as a God-forsaken place. There may not be any Christians there, but then when we go there, even one person goes there, the Lord is there. Because He lives in us. We should never forget that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. And wherever we go, we are the fragrance of the gospel. And the Lord wants to reveal Christ in us to others. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatians in chapter 1 from verse 15. For when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son in me, then I preach among Gentiles. I didn't consult any man. He says, God is pleased to reveal his son in me. So it's all a question of God revealing Christ in us to others. And we must remember that just because we receive Christ into our hearts to save our Lord, we have become temples of the Holy Spirit. And God begins his work in us, in and through us, from that point of time. He will never give up on us. He's always at work in us. When you're aware of that, we will be offering our entire self to Him, not just our strengths, also our weaknesses. The other day I was sharing, when I'm doing a series of meetings on uh, Mondays and uh, on Fridays uh, to a particular church in Delhi, and the topic we're doing right now is uh, weakness to strength. How God will change our weakness and make it to strengths. And sometimes when you serve God, we are very uh, conscious about our strengths and we are very, very uh, apologetic about our weaknesses. Why I can't do this? I'm weak in this area. What you forget is we are the workmanship of God. So we're going to see how we can work with God in Him revealing Christ in us to other people. Now let me go to the Old Testament time and we come to the New Testament where we are today. In the Old Testament time, God chose the, nation, chose the nation of Israel to be given the commandments so that as they will obey the commandments, nations around them will recognize that the God of Israel is a true God. One question many people have today is, what is so special about the Israelites? Why did God choose these people? They are proud people, arrogant people, and they think no of themselves. They are gifted people, yes, but they are very arrogant and why did God choose them among all the nations of the world? This question was addressed as early as in the first century itself. In the book of Romans, chapter 3, the one and first and second verse, Paul writes, What advantage is there in being a Jew? What the advantage of circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, they've been given the oracles of God. God gave them the word of God. That's why they're so special. But then he gave them the word conditionally. Before he gave the commandments to Israel, Israelites through Moses, he asked them a question in Exodus 19, chapter 4, 5, 6. You yourself know what I did to Egypt, how I carried an eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, 
out of all the nations we my treasured possession although the whole earth is mine you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation only when they agreed to obey god in verse eight they says we will obey everything the lord tells us to do only then god gave them the commandments first 10 commandments at mount sinai later on 603 more commandments totally 603 commandments in the old testament it was given conditionally if you obey me fully all the nations are mine in the world whole earth is mine if you obey me what god says is through you nations will know that i am the true god so god had a plan for all nations to understand realize the god of israel is the true god in fact before they enter the land of canaan the lord told them through moses deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 5 Four verse six, Deuteronomy four six. Observe carefully all these commandments, for this will show your wisdom among the nations, who hear of the decrees and say, "Surely, this great nation is a wise and understanding people." God wanted all the nations to know His wisdom, His workmanship. That is the people of Israel, and that's why after they enter the land of Canaan. In Isaiah forty nine three, the Lord told them, "You are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendor." His plan was that through the nation of Israel, their obedience actually, God's splendor displayed to all the nations, but it was conditional. But they failed God, and God spoke about a new future generation, you and me. New Testament believers in Isaiah sixty one three, they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. This God spoke through Isaiah around seven twenty BC. Then again, after more than hundred years, they are again disobeying God, the Israelites, and God sent the prophets. This time He sent Jeremiah to warn them against. Persistent disobedience, and when they persisted, they were exiled to Babylon. And while they were in Babylon, God ever gave them up. To Ezekiel, God spoke to them. Ezekiel thirty six twenty three. I will show the holiness of my great name, which have been profaned among the nations. The name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know. I am the Lord. When I show myself holy through you before their eyes, so God wants to show His holiness through these people who are disobedient to God to all the nations. And the Lord spoke about how He would do it. Verses twenty-five to twenty-seven. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. The reverse of the word of God, actually. I will cleanse you. From all impurities and all your idols, I'll give a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will take away a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. Prophecy. When they fail God, God says, "I will do. I will do it. You are blaspheming my name before the Gentiles, but I'll show my holiness through you before their eyes." And he says, "I will do this." And today we have the amazing privilege of knowing the church today is a holy nation. First Peter two nine. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. That he will declare the praise of Him who called you from darkness to His wonderful light. So today we are the holy nation. And when God spoke through Isaiah a prophecy about oaks of righteousness, a Planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. We are those people. Wherever we are, we are a planting of the Lord for the display of God's splendor. That is God's plan for the believers today. You should know who we are. Please never forget that Christ lives in us, and God will reveal Christ in us to other people around us. 
They are called to be the fragrance of life to those who are saved. They are also the smell of death to those who are perishing. Smell of death, which means everyone won't like us. Nobody likes the smell of death, no? Even devil doesn't like the smell of death. And therefore, we can't expect to be popular wherever we go. Because some will love us, some will hate us. So you should know what it means to be a person having Christ's spirit in him or her. Even Jesus was hated by people. He was hated. He told his own brothers in the, in the um, seventh chapter of John, in verse 7, he says, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me. Because I testify what it does is evil. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me. Because I testify what it does is evil. Today, as we are Christians and we have Christ living inside us, God will reveal Christ in us to other people, sometimes even without our knowledge. Or our role is basically to ensure that he has full control of our lives and we don't come in the way of him working in and through us. The Apostle Paul, in Romans 15, 18, he writes, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. Being Gentiles, to obey God, what I said and done, by the power of signs and miracles, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's all a question of letting God have full control of our lives, allowing the Holy Spirit to work in and through us, and we being spectators in what God does through us. Stepping aside in a way, letting God have full control. Not interfering with his work in our lives. When you have Christ as Lord in our hearts, there's no place for other things in our hearts. And very often these days I speak about the heart being very deceitful. And the Lord spoke about so many things, unwanted things in our hearts. But he spoke about that from the abundant heart, the mouth speaks. And he spoke about the fact that what goes in man's mouth doesn't make him unclean. What comes out of his mouth makes him unclean. And the Lord identified 14 different qualities in the heart of man. In the heart of man. In Matthew 15, 19, he identified seven qualities. And in Mark 7, 22, he identified seven more qualities. Altogether, 14. Why am I saying this? Because if Christ is the Lord of our hearts, there's no place for these things in our hearts. If he's the Lord, he'll have full control. We should allow these things to go into our heart. What are the seven things mentioned in Matthew 15, 19? Evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. In Mark 7, 22, seven more qualities. Greed, Malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, arrogance, folly. Fourteen qualities in the heart of man. Can you imagine? So we should ensure our role in the Lord working in and through us is not allowing these things to remain in our hearts, to circumcise these things. Circumcision actually is cutting off. Old Testament time was a physical circumcision on the eighth day. They circumcised the child. But what God really wanted is not physical circumcision as much as spiritual circumcision. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4, the Lord says, Circumcise yourself to the Lord. Circumcise your hearts. Your hearts. Cut off things in the heart. New Testament. Circumcision again. Romans 2 29. Circumcision. He circumvent the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, it's from God. So when we go to God in prayer, the Holy Spirit, 
he is a counselor he will reveal to us for the unwanted qualities of our heart when we agree with this counsel he will empower us to circumcise those things cut it off not allow those things to continue in our heart put it behind completely and then as we realize that lord is Christ the lord of our hearts we let him have full control first of all by letting our minds be controlled by the spirit now how these things get to the heart actually the 14 qualities maybe some more also there i don't know some other additional qualities now whatever keep thinking gets into our heart for example in jeremiah chapter 4 verse 14 we read jeremiah 4 14 lord says o jerusalem wash the sin from your heart and be saved how long will you harbor wicked thoughts when you harbor wicked thoughts these wicked thoughts percolate into the spirit and they contaminate the spirit that's why bible exalts us to be a people who guard our hearts proverbs 4:23 guard your heart it's a wellspring of life so being the fragrance of life basically means we work with god in him working in us and keeping in mind the things of god our minds being controlled by the spirit not by the sinful nature when our minds are controlled by the sinful nature meaning what we see what we hear unwanted things worthless things they affect our hearts for example in psalm 119 verse 36 and 37 the psalmist says Turn my heart towards your statutes and not towards selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Our eyes and our ears, when they focus on things of this world, we hear things, we see things, occupy the mind. And the minds are controlled by those things we see and hear, unwanted things. Then it affects the heart because it gets into the spirit. So the question is, what do we think about? Romans chapter 8, verse 5 and 6 says, Romans chapter 8, verse 5 and 6, Paul writes, those who, live in, those who live according to sinful nature have their mind set on what the nature desires. Those who live in accordance with the spirit have the mind set what the spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. As the minds are stayed upon the things of God, what God speaks to us, what God does to us, we'll find that without our knowledge, subconsciously, our mind gets renewed. I get so many testimonies in my WhatsApp. Every other day I get testimonies of people in the Zoom who have been part of our Zoom for the last one year. And plus they look at other Zoom meetings also. And they say that the lives are changed without there have any effort, simply by letting God's word go into heart and mind. And other people tell them that you are changing. Others notice that. God make others understand you are changing. That's the work of God. That's how we know it's Him working, not us. We can't change ourselves. God changes us. I remember I was asked a question by some Russians, uh, Russian uh, atheists in, in Siberia. Uh, how do you know that God lives as a God? How do you know there's a God? I said, He changed my life. He changed my life. That's how I know. If I change my life, then it's a different story. I didn't change my life. He changed my life. They didn't uh, understand what I said. Then they asked me, How do you know Jesus rose from the dead? How do you know He's alive today? I said, He changed my life. I know. But how do you know He's alive today? And I told them, this morning he spoke to me. This morning he spoke to me. So I know he's alive. Then they asked me, how will I know he's alive? How will we know he's alive? I said, you talk to me, you'll talk to you. He's alive. He loves to talk to you, you talk to him. So when you allow our minds to be constantly ministered to by the Spirit of God and the Word of God, we change 
the mind changes, the heart changes. And please ensure always that you guard your hearts. Yeah, these different unwanted things will get into the heart. On the other hand, you have to set apart Christ as Lord of our lives. A simple common thing like fear, anxiety. It says in the Bible, when people are having anxieties, Christians, Peter wrote them, Peter, in 1 Peter 3.14, he writes, do not fear what they fear. Who are they? People out around the church in, in those regions. He wrote to Christians living in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia. Five areas. To them he wrote the first letter. And there were believers there in these areas. Churches were there. Surrounded by unbelievers. Gentiles. Mixed population. Among the believers there were the Jews and the Jewish uh, Gentile believers. Mixed, totally mixed. And when people around them are having fears, even the Christians had fears. Unwanted fears, unnecessary, but they had fears. What does Peter write to them? 1 Peter 3.14 Don't fear what they fear, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. In your heart, Christ must be Lord. Totally occupying the heart. Everything Christ-centered, our beliefs, our ambitions, our talks, our aim in life, purpose in life, all Christ-centered. Then what happens is, you won't have fear. If he's a lot of your life, we'll understand his amazing love. And 1 John 4.18 says, perfect love drives out fear. Fear has little punishment. So being the fragrance of life to people is basically uh, Lord revealing Christ in us to other people, sometimes without our knowledge also. And our role is to let him have full control. Our minds controlled by the Spirit, Holy Spirit. And he'll change our hearts. The problem with many Christians is we are not so much concerned about what we think or what is in the heart. We are concerned about the outward life. What people think about me, what they see in me, what they hear from me. We are very concerned about the way we live before the people around us and the words we speak. What God is concerned is our hearts. For example, the Lord Jesus Christ told the Pharisees, He rebuked them for the hypocrisy. In Matthew 23rd chapter, 23rd chapter, verses 25-26, He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, First clean the inside of the cup and dish, outside also be clean. It is a simple solution, so clear for children it is. Clean inside, also be clean. So we must be, remember the concern about the inside. And the Holy Spirit is a counsellor, he will tell us what is inside. He is a counsellor. He will reveal to us our hearts. So whenever you go to God in prayer, personal prayer, Ask him to show your heart. In Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, David writes, it's a prayer, Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See, when you offensive weighed me, he will be in the way everlasting. This is asking God to reveal his heart. Moses wrote in his Psalm, Psalm 90 verse 8. Psalm 90 verse 8. You have set our iniquities before you. Our secret sins in the light of your presence. These 14 things I mentioned to you. I didn't know that till I read those two those passages. And I examined myself how many of those could be in my heart. 14 qualities, can you imagine? Hidden things, secret. But what is will reveal. 
what in heart he'll reveal secrets and he'll reveal secret to people secret to us also we all don't know that's why david said you search my heart i am not capable of searching my heart my heart is very deceitful i i don't know you search my heart and god is so faithful he will counsel us before you do something wrong he'll counsel us don't do it if you do something wrong he'll convict us you done wrong he'll convict us when we repent and we repent he will empower us to turn from it so the question of are we living by the spirit are our minds controlled by the spirit when he make this a daily exercise of fellowship with god and let him have my full control of our lives move out of the way let him have full control and not only putting away our own sins we also have to put away our egos egos because sometimes when you work living a very good life apparently there's no sin in that at point of time there's no sin in your heart but then you're so wonderful life will really everyone praises you it can affect our pride we become proud proud in our hearts humility of pride is a matter of the heart so even then god will counsel us my dear child you're developing conceit pride and one sign of that pride is when you get hurt by some insult someone makes someone insults you get hurt and you realize you are hurt because the pride is hurt ego was hurt kill it brutally kill the ego because for rise relation 220 i have been crucified with christ i no longer live but christ lives in me and the life i now live in the body I live by faith the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me so kill the pride remove all these qualities and let christ be lord of your lives and in fact set apart christ as lord in your hearts in your hearts about christ as lord then what happens as we go about a daily life constantly being led by the spirit god will make us a display of his splendor he'll make us his workmanship Ephesians 2:10 we are the workmanship of god wherever we go he display christ in us to other people without our knowledge or sometimes he make people come to us cuz they see christ in us we don't see christ in us we believe he lives in us i don't see christ living in me but i know many people who come look at my life with Christ to live through me without my trying to be a witness to them some of them to know there's something special about us they're drawn to us because they see we are the fragrance of life especially in the context of having peace in the midst of difficulties when you walk with god you have peace oneness with god that peace is a peace beyond understanding that peace we can manifest in the midst of difficulties when people see difficulties that we have and yet we see the peace in us they are drawn to us they realize this is a different kind of peace this guy has got they are god bring them to us many times while god takes us to people he brings people to us also they were guided by the holy spirit to tell this man has what you are seeking for you want peace he's got peace and i find many times that people come to us because god makes them recognize who christ uh, christ lives in us and he will display christ in us to others if we simply walk in step with the spirit we don't try to try, we don't have to try too hard to be witnesses just love god with all your heart all your soul all your mind all your strength and just be yourself he will reveal christ in us to others you will be surprised how he reveals as it says about samuel samuel was raised up by god at a time when the word of god was read there were not many visions first samuel 3 one says in those days the word of god was read there were not many visions and god raised up a child by name samuel and as samuel was faithful to what god spoke to him responded 
you find that God attested Samuel as a prophet of God. As he listened to God, as the Lord speak yourself to listening, God began to speak more to him. And 1 Samuel chapter 3, 19, 20, 21 says, the Lord was Samuel as he grew up, and let one of his words for the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel, Samuel was attested as a prophet of God. Who attested him? Well, God attested him. He'll attest you as, your, as his child. He'll attest me as his child. Not to go around, don't have to go around telling everybody that I'm a Christian, I'm this, I'm that. No need. Remember, we are the bride of Christ. He's the bridegroom, we are the bride. When you go for a wedding, do you ask people who's the bride? When you go for a wedding, do you ask people who's the bride? Here? You look around, you know who the bride is. The best dressed lady in that wedding is the bride. Of course, some women, they compete with the bride, how to look with all the jewels on. That's a different story. But normally the bride, we know by looking at the, uh, the bride. Similarly, when people see us, they will know we are special. We belong to the Holy One who purchased us by His blood. And therefore, remember, God is at work in us. He'll make us the fragrance of life to those who are saved. And also, we are the smell of death to those who are perishing. So don't expect everyone to love you, everyone to accept you. Some will love you, some will hate you. Some will accept you, some will reject you. They hated Jesus, no? They rejected Jesus. One very big problem Christians have today is how to handle rejection. They feel very bad. They rejected me. They feel very bad because their pride is hurt. How can I be rejected? I'm a servant of God. They're rejecting me. It's part of a calling to be rejected sometimes. First Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also live living stones are being built a spiritual house. To be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable God to Jesus Christ. Some people love you, some will hate you. Both are part of Christian life. It's part of a calling. There have been people who tried to come and kill me. Twice it happened. Once of all places in Chennai it happened. One group of young people were very upset with my preaching. Someone said, hey, somebody's come there, he wants to kill you. I said, uh, after meeting, we'll take you from the back door, we'll go. I said, no, no, I'll stay here. Okay. Then I said, go bring him and come. Oh, he's very serious, brother. He's a serious, he wants to kill you. So go bring him now only. Are you sure? I said, bring him. They brought him. As he came near me, he was shouting at me. Why do you say he's the only way of Christ? Only, only way of salvation? Why do you say he's the only way? He's angry at me. And then I told him what, uh, what his faith is actually. He didn't know his own faith. And just long, cut a long story short. He went away quietly. Went away quietly because I told him whatever he believes is, is not really a, the, the religion he believes in is actually a way of life. And there's a search for God. And for that search end is Christ. He went away. Another uh, case happened in, in, a, in a place called uh, Orai. Orai was the place that the bandit queen, uh, uh, Pulan Devi was born in her hometown. Then one gang came to kill me. They came rushing with sticks. I put a hedge around me. And this man was so angry. He asked me in Hindi, kya ho hai? He gave to me say, grand karna kya hai? So I told him 25 years back, I got saved by this Jesus. I got the gift of salvation. It's for everybody, this gift. I got this gift. I know it's for everybody. So I come here to everybody about that gift. So simple. That's all. There were 20 people around him with sticks. He's the ringleader. I was having dinner and then I, they all surrounded me. I told him, I come here to tell about this salvation. I got this gift so many years back. It's for everybody here. You know, where I also. I want to come here to tell them about this gift. You know what he said? Ujjabi batao. Tell me also. So I said, okay, I'll tell you also. So I shared the gospel with him. After 15 minutes, he didn't accept Christ, but he said, after meeting you, I'm having a lot of peace. But I hear them, I'm very happy. 
शांति है आपसे मिल सकते हैं दिल्ली में चैप्टर Six and seven, we read. Second Corinthians, fourth chapter, six and seven. For God, who said, "Let light shine out of darkness," made His light shine in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. That's our body, clay, jars of clay, earthen vessels. to show that this all surpassing power is from god and not from us in us there's a power because christ lives in us knowing him is power the same god who said let light shine out of darkness made his light shine in our hearts a heart is full of darkness i told you 14 things in that heart he puts his light christ And then it goes on to say, "To give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ, glory of God in the face of Christ. This is a knowledge, and that's light. That's why we are the lights of the world. We are the lights of the world because we have the revelation, and Christ Himself living inside us. The Apostle Paul knew fully well that God is in the business of revealing." Christ in us to others. You don't have to go around telling people Christ is in me. Christ is in me. You must know yourself. Christ lives in you. God will make other people understand that as they respond to situations. Simply obey Him. Childlike obedience that results in His peace, His joy manifested through us. By the love we have for each other. In John thirteen thirty five, Jesus says. By this, all men know you, my disciples, by the love we have for each other. God wants to reveal His love through us to others, His wisdom through the church, to the body, to the whole world. If you look at Colossians, Ephesians three ten. It says Ephesians three ten. His will is that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God be made known to all the authorities through the church. What the Old Testament Jews were supposed to be to the nations around them, when God chose the nation of Israel to be given the commandments, He had a plan for the Israelites to be an example to all the nations. Today we are the holy nation, and God wants to reveal His identity to all people of this world through the church, you and me, because He is the head of this church. He lives in us. So wherever you go, wherever I go, we are called to be the fragrance of the gospel. You know, when I look at my life all these years, the times I felt I became very, very close to God was the times when I was physically alone. I met the Lord when I was physically alone in Germany. Then I grew in the Lord in a wonderful way in England when I was living alone in a big mansion. My brother had a very big mansion, twenty twenty rooms. It was a manor house in Kritham, a tennis court on on uh, three and a half acres lawn, swimming pool. I was the only one living there. I was living there and working in Russia. That was my base alone. How God pampered me, and I enjoyed my time with God. Nobody was there. Night was very very quiet. A small little village in 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 England, Kritham. It's called Kritham village. Our house was Kritham house. Kritham house was the main house in Kritham. And I was living there alone. At that time, I grew so much in the Lord, alone, depending upon. When I went to Siberia, in Siberia again, living alone, God ministered to me, ministered to me constantly. So wherever I go, wherever you go, He goes. There is no God for second place in the world. Remember that. Siberia was considered God for second place. They would send people to Siberia. They are the communists. 
the pastors when in the Russia was sent there in the 1917-1920 to, to the prison camp in the north. Today, Siberia is a place where so many people began believers. God took me there. Can you imagine? Amazing ways. So, no place is God forsaken. And don't complain about, oh, I come to a new place. There's no fellowship here. No proper church. You have fellowship with God in, in, who lives inside you. How can anyone say there's no fellowship? He lives in us. And sometimes God will take away from comfort zone for us to depend upon him. We are never lonely. We are never lonely. Last three months I've been living alone, physically alone, after Ragni passed away. Hardly any visitors. Only cook comes once and for one hour in the day, which then goes away. Three months I've been living, and time is flying. Time is flying. Because I'm busy with the ministry. My whole day is prayer, finishing God's work, counseling people, prayer requests, prayers. That's all I'm doing. Whole day. How joyful it is. How joyful. I keep on doing that. More and more, I believe. Till either he comes here or I go to him. So, remember, we are the fragrance of the gospel. Wherever we go. And through us, gospel is everywhere his fragrance. And Paul says, God is pleased to reveal his son in me. So, it's God's business to reveal Christ in us. Don't try to go around telling people, oh, Christ is me, Christ is me. You must know yourself for your own sake. As you walk with the Lord, make sure everything in the heart is removed. He is Lord of your life. You will find God will attest you as his child, as his servant, and the only titles. So when I go and travel different places, people introduce me in very bombastic ways, exotic ways. But for me, the best introduction is Rajkumar, child of God. My name is Prince. My father is King of Kings. That is enough. Rajkumar. Child of God, enough. Bonus is, bonus is servant of God. Child is more than enough. By being a servant of God is a bonus. Extra bonus. Nothing more you need. All of us are servants. All of us are children. Be happy with that. Content. And as you realize that in this earthen vessel is a treasure. The treasure is Jesus. Be aware of it. Every day live for him. Have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. As when sin creeps in, throw it away, circumcise it, and learn to enjoy God. And then after you'll find you are a spectator in what God does to you. Hallelujah. Praise God.